it has been around four months since we had access to the Co3 single player pre-alpha. So let's have a look at what has changed in terms of economy, territory control and pacing for the multiplayer pre-alpha. First off, let's take a look at the manpower system and there were two different factions available in the multiplayer pre-alpha, Vermacht and US forces. At zero population, they both get the same 270 manpower per minute. However, at 100 out of 100 population, Vermacht have roughly double the manpower per minute that the US forces do. The reason for this appears to be the large number of upgrades the US forces have to help reduce their manpower drain. The most important of which, and the earliest to arrive, is the field medic system tied into their medical station. When there is a wounded soldier on the battlefield, commonly referred to as a crawler, the field medics will enter the battlefield and try to rescue him. If the field medic makes it back to the medical station with the wounded soldier, the next model from a squad that gets reinforced will cost zero manpower, greatly reducing the US player's manpower expenditure over the course of a game. Overall, doing an analysis on these different systems is too tough for me at this stage, so I'll just have to trust that Relic will be able to fine-tune these different values to provide a cohesive experience compared to the other factions in Company of Heroes 3. Now comparing Company of Heroes 3's Vermacht to Company of Heroes 2, where every faction has the same manpower, in Company of Heroes 2 you start with 30 manpower per minute more, and at full pop cap your manpower income is halved, exactly the same upkeep mechanic as Company of Heroes 3's Vermacht. However, it is not that simple. Here you can see at 4 population I still have full manpower income, 270 per minute. Then producing a 6 pop cap unit I lost 5 manpower per minute. Then producing another 6 pop cap unit I lost 8 manpower per minute. So it appears there is some kind of reduced manpower tax for Vermacht below 10 pop cap. It's a similar story for US forces. The first scout not costing you any manpower, but then I produce a rifleman, 6 pop cap, and I lose 12 manpower per minute. Reading up on some old Co1 forum posts, in that game, the different armies got a different amount of free pop cap at the start of the match. For Vermacht it was 14, and for US forces it was 6. Also in Co1, each unit had a unique upkeep cost that wasn't directly tied to its population cost like it is in Co2. Here are two armies of roughly the same size for US forces in Co3, and the composition that has a few tanks mixed in has significantly more manpower per minute than the one made up solely of infantry. So it appears US forces pays more upkeep for infantry than they do for tanks, perhaps necessitating some of those upgrades that I mentioned earlier. It appears to be the opposite for Vermacht, however, where a composition with a few tanks mixed in has significantly worse manpower income than one made up solely of infantry. Vermacht also have upgrades in this area, though they don't have as many or rely on them as much as the US forces do. So overall the manpower income and upkeep system for Company of Heroes 3 is much more complicated than it was for Company of Heroes 2. Though this should open up different strategical options through the various upgrades, and it should offer more opportunities to fine tune balance at different phases of the game. Now if we take a look at the different resource points out on the map, you can see that all of these values have been directly copied from Company of Heroes 1. The only exception to this is the victory point in Company of Heroes 3 takes 5 seconds longer to decapture. And here are the numbers for Company of Heroes 2 as a comparison, but these only tell half the story, we need to take a look at a few of the different maps to see how these points are actually distributed. Having a look at the sole 1v1 map that was available in the Co3 pre-alpha Twin Beaches, adding up all the resource points on the map gives 82 munitions per minute and 46 fuel per minute. Fighting out of the cold 2 corner, we have Holodny Firma, which has been part of the 1v1 map rotation since day 1, that has 72 munitions per minute and 44 fuel per minute. And for Co1 we have Langres, which has 76 munitions per minute and 40 fuel per minute. So now I'm going to halve these values, then add in the resources that you gain while holding zero territory in each of the different games. So you can see that the resources you gain per minute from holding exactly half of the map are quite similar between all three games, with Co 1's Langres lacking a bit in the munitions department, but with Co 3 having such a low amount of base income, losing control of your territory is going to be the most punishing it has ever been, and could also lead to quite a slow early game. 
So let's now examine how long it will take you to accumulate half of the map in terms of territory control in all three games. For the maps with an uneven number of sectors, I split them in half. As you would expect, given they use near identical systems, the types for Co1 and Co3 are very similar, and you would expect these numbers to vary from map to map given all the different sector combination possibilities available on Company Pharaohs 1 and Company Pharaohs 3. And that could be quite fun for map makers to experiment with. Whereas the total capture times for Company Pharaohs 2 are around 40% faster, which is a massive difference. Part of this can be explained by the more plentiful use of capture rate bonuses on different units in Company Pharaohs 3 and Company Pharaohs 1. In Company Pharaohs 2, capture rate bonuses were very rare, given only to a handful of different units and commander abilities. Whereas in Company Pharaohs 3, a lot of the most common units have a capture rate bonus, and the dedicated capping squads such as the Scout and the Kitten Crad have even larger capture rate bonuses. These different capture rate bonuses will provide interesting challenges to the player on how they want to tackle capturing the map, since using a unit that has a high capture rate bonus can provide massive time savings. So for the sake of simplicity, let's say the capture rate bonus averages out to 1.25 across your entire army, and then we divide the Company of Heroes three times by 1.25, the result is still significantly higher than the times for Company of Heroes 2. And the difference is especially noticeable when you add in the decapture times as well, taking 100 seconds longer in Company of Heroes 3 to capture half of the map. So overall, I do like the more widespread use of capture bonuses, adding another skill testing element to the map control equation. However, I do worry that in Company of Heroes 3, the vast majority of territory harassment is going to be focused on the cutoffs, since the other points take such a long time comparatively to decapture. And that being able to build your own cover on the capture circles, such as sandbags, is going to be even stronger than it was in Company of Heroes 2, since you're going to be spending a much longer time on those capture circles. Related to this is how large the maps themselves are. So to figure this out, I ran a squad of infantry from the retreated position to my opponent's base and stop the clock when the opponent's base MGs started shooting at the squad, and then also timed how long it took the squad to run end to end across the centre portion of the map. It's not perfect, but it should give us a decent idea of how large the maps are. So comparing the Co3 maps to a few of the most popular Co2 maps, you can see that Twin Beaches is the largest of the 1v1 maps, but only by a small margin, and on average the 2v2 maps in Company Furious 3 are slightly larger than their Company Pharaohs 2 counterparts. So now let's take a look at the cost of various units to see whether we'll be able to fill up that extra map space with extra army. First, let's take a look at the initial manpower costs. And for Company of Heroes 3, the infantry and team weapons are cheaper than they were in Company of Heroes 2. And perhaps this makes sense given that you start with 30 manpower per minute less. However, the Co3 vehicles are a touch more expensive, and when it comes to reinforcement costs, the Co3 values are quite a bit cheaper than they were in Company Pharaohs 2. The reinforcement cost equation for Company Pharaohs 2 was that you'll take the initial manpower cost, halve it, and then divide it by the model count of the squad. You can see that riflemen still hold true to that equation, and Rear Echelon did until a patch earlier this year. Units that have a special spawner mechanic, such as paratroopers getting airdropped in, or infiltration spawns out of buildings would come at a manpower premium that wasn't included in the reinforcement cost. And for team weapons, a lot of the unit's cost was tied up in the weapon itself, not the crew members, so they also had cheaper reinforcement costs. And now if we apply this equation to Company Pharaohs 3, you see that engineers should cost more to reinforce and riflemen should cost less, which is rather curious, but do remember USF and Co3 have a lot of upgrades in this area. When it comes to population costs, Co3 is significantly cheaper than Co2 right across the board, so you will be able to field a larger army, though you may have trouble affording a larger army because of the high upkeep costs we saw earlier. And finally, when it comes to fuel, all the vehicles are much cheaper in Company Pharaohs 3 than they were in Company Pharaohs 2. Now let's take a look at the ticking costs for US forces in all three games. The tech structure for Co2 is quite a lot different to the other two games but Co3 and Co1 are nearly identical. So comparing the tech cost of those two games, you can see the motor pool and tank depot are a little bit different 
In Code 3, they cost less manpower, but more fuel. Also, the side tech in Code 3 is significantly cheaper than it was in Code 1. A common comparison for Company of Heroes 2 was how quickly the different factions could push out a medium tank. So let's take a look at that for all three of these games. You can see that Company of Heroes 2 has the highest fuel cost, largely because of the increased cost of the Sherman itself, but the lowest manpower cost. And it is quite a common complaint that you get armor out too quickly in Company of Heroes 2. But maybe in Company of Heroes 3, your manpower is supposed to be the sticking point instead of your fuel reserves. Now let's take a look at army sizes, and here is a typical US Forces Company of Heroes 2 army. And now recreating that in the other two games, the population cost is way lower in Company of Heroes 3, so you should be able to field a much larger army than you did in Company of Heroes 2. And now if we plot those two points on the graph, you can see the manpower per minute difference between Code 2 and Code 3 has shrunk significantly. And this graph shows the worst case scenario for USF and Code 3, no economic upgrades, and an army made up entirely of infantry. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to create this exact army in Company of Heroes 3, but it is conceivable that with all those economic upgrades working and the field medics, that you will actually have more manpower per minute than you did in Company of Heroes 2 for the same sized army. Examining how long it takes to build a variety of units, the times between Code 2 and Code 3 are quite similar overall, except for anti-tank guns and mortars, meaning that building an anti-tank gun reactive fleet is going to be significantly worse than it was in Company of Heroes 2. And here are the different tech timings. To me, the most interesting is that in Company of Heroes 3, your healing is much quicker to come online. Now taking a look at the unit costs for Vermacht, their squad sizes in Co3 and Co2 are vastly different, so doing a direct comparison in terms of manpower and reinforcement doesn't really work that well, though the reinforcement cost of team weapons in Co3 seem to be very expensive. So now if we apply the reinforcement formula to a couple of the units in Co3, unlike for US forces that we saw earlier, their numbers do conform to the formula, however they are rounded down. Once again, the fuel cost for vehicles in Code 3 is much cheaper than it is in Code 2, and most of the population costs for Vermacht in Code 3 are cheaper than they were for Vermacht in Code 2. And then recreating the typical Code 2 army in the other two games, you can see the Code 3 values are significantly cheaper in terms of pop cap than they were in Code 2, so you should be able to field a much larger army, just like you could with US forces. Now taking a look at the tech costs, and you can see the ticking systems are all very different between the three games. So let's look at how much it costs to bring out the Panzer IV. Now these aren't realistic build orders, severely lacking in anti-tank capabilities. However, it is cheaper to get a medium tank in Code 3 than it is in Code 2. And once again, it is because of the lower fuel cost of the tank itself. Looking at how long it takes to produce certain units in all three games, and they are pretty similar overall, the main difference being in snipers and anti-tank guns, taking a lot longer to produce in Co3 than they did in Co2. So overall you can see there is a much larger influence coming from Company of Heroes 1, adding a lot more complexity to these foundational game systems. And while these should open up more options to the player, which is a great thing, they'll probably also make the game harder to learn and trickier to balance. If you want to see more videos like this in the future, please consider coming on board as a Patreon backer.